Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk today. Um, it's something that's been an interest of mine for quite a few years, ever since a, a, a paper we did, actually for my master's program, and then it was piggybacked a little bit by some work that Rena did. And it's something that I really feel is an area of where we can improve how we teach our learners without considerable effort and considerable time. And I feel like that's the holy grail of everything in education. If you can do something better with little effort and little time, you've got it going on. So this is going to hopefully focus on that. So it's all about role modeling. And um, I have a disclaimer. We always have to talk about our disclosures. And my disclaimer is only that if you know this scene, uh, it's when the wizard says to the scarecrow, but they have one thing you haven't got, a diploma. And that's my only thing I say. Every time I give a talk and every time I think about these things, I am no better than anyone at this. I, you'll hear many examples today of where I'm worse than most of you. Uh, but I think about it a lot. Uh, and I've got a degree in it, which makes me think about it a lot. And that's the only real thing that's different. So I am as much in the trenches as every single person. So uh, first of all, I want to get a sense of who's in the room. Um, how many people, we won't go around. Don't worry, I'm not going to panic anybody. Everybody tell me your favorite hobby. Uh, how many people in here are? Are, uh, are we all, we're not, we're all different specialties, Rena? How many people are medicine? I like you, it's okay. How many people are pediatrics? Thank you. Go team. How many people are in OB? Surgery. Emergency medicine. Family. It's medicine and peds. Rock on. Who's, who is not an MD? And what are all you people? Social workers, excellent. That's awesome. Do we have any learners in the room? Oh, one of my favorites on peds. You know we got to like that, right? That's what we love. Um, any learners, medical students, residents? Any PhDs? Yeah, smarter than me. Awesome. All right, so we have a nice, diverse, eclectic group. And I'll tell you, we'll talk, we're going to talk focused on in, in medical education, but I honestly think role modeling and how we think of it transcends transcends just medicine, and we'll talk a little bit about how it focuses uh, on UME and GME. So uh, my objectives, I have to have objectives, right? So we're going to talk about the definition, uh, but really we're going to start with talking about the impact, and hopefully by the end of this you'll have a framework and some really concrete ways you could apply it within your educational practice. So I'll start with the case for why this is important. We'll look at some of the backdrop, and then we're going to go through definitions because if I ask any of you right now, do you feel comfortable defining role modeling? Wait for it, because I'm going to ask you for a definition in a little while. So if you want to just start taking notes, you're going to be called on. Don't worry about it. And then we'll, uh, then we'll talk about practical application after we look at a framework. So here's the case. What do we know? What do we know about role modeling? Because I'll be honest, I didn't know much about it. I just thought role modeling, that's that thing. And it I, seems like it's something that's good if you have it. But there's a lot of really interesting background on role modeling. And so probably the biggest one is Albert Bandura, who wrote in the 60s about the idea of modeling and that uh, modeling is through the process of observation and imitation. Um, he did the famous Bobo doll experiment. It was this um, weighted bottom doll. Like, do you guys remember Weebles? Oh yeah, good generation. But it's taller, and they basically had kids come in, and they had um, someone have aggressive behaviors towards the doll, and then they saw if the kids would imitate it or not, especially depending on the outcome and what was the gender of the person who role modeled. And they actually found that kids would imitate what was going on. And so he proposed within um, his, his area of expertise in learning theory that modeling was a very powerful tool that used observation by someone resulting in imitation. And there were four factors, conditions, that were necessary for role modeling. The first is that you had to be paying attention, right? Now, I'll quickly, we're going we're gonna to talk about this through the broader area, but how many people have been in a situation where you think you are role modeling, but the person you think you're role modeling for is not paying attention? <laughs> right, yeah, right. So that's, that's condition number one being violated, right? So there is this element that you have to have people pay attention. And a lot as learn. how many times have you been the learner who wasn't paying attention? Yeah, right? All the time for me, I'm attention deficit. I never pay attention, right? So the first step to modeling in his, in his theory was that you have to pay attention. Once you have attention, then you have to have retention. You have to remember what happened. 
So not only do you have to see it and pay attention to it and recognize it in a sense that this is something you want to keep, but then you have to remember it. And I, Lord knows as I've gotten older and have two kids, I don't remember anything anymore. But you have to remember and say, that was a really interesting thing that I want to remember. From there, you have to be able to reproduce it. This is really interesting when it comes to medical education, right? Um, reproducing how you talk to a patient. Maybe I observe my attending and I'm paying attention when they give bad news, as an example, and I retain what they did, but I have to retain all the pieces of what they did. But then can I do it? Well, talking seems like an easy thing to reproduce, but procedures may not be, right? And so you have to have the physicality. And when they were talking about this with kids, obviously, um, developmental milestones were really important, but that's not different from our learners, right? Developmentally, we go through a process, and so could they reproduce it? And then the last thing is you have to have motivation um, to do it. And so having that motivation as a learner uh, to take what you've seen and say, this is something that's really important to me, ties into value, it ties into a variety of different things. And so the idea in his world of modeling is you had to have these four conditions, and then imitation was a big point of it. And we're going to get at imitation and role modeling in medical education because it's going to be an important point. So how does this filter into medical education? Well, there's a lot of ways. If you look around the literature, professionalism, professionalism is probably the biggest thing where they talk about it. That um, as far back as 2000 in Canada, they've talked about professionalism and that you need to have good role models. That was, that's actually been the core of how we've learned in medicine, right? And the apprentice model, we would watch that. How many, how many people watched something their attending did when they were a learner and just were like, yep, that's a role model, I'm going to do that, right? Yeah, we all did. That's how we learned, right? Now we're a little bit more competency-based. We're more, more active in these other areas, and we're calling things out. But it's still a lot of what we're doing is from observing our role models. And professionalism, we learn professionalism distinctly in that way. Now the flip side, and we'll talk about, is that we can learn bad skills through observation and through modeling as well. The hidden curriculum is huge, right? And this is more the negative aspect of it that when we go through the first two years and we learn something wonderful about how we're supposed to do this, that, or and the other, and then the first time we're on the wards and then our attending does something completely different, right? Okay, role modeling is a powerful negative tool in that sense, displaying the hidden curriculum for us. And then uh, just how we form our professional identity, right? Professional identity formation is really, I think, picking up steam for our conversation. But how we learn who we are and what we want to do is through our role models, um, through the people that we see. And we'll talk about how we phrase them um, from how they do. And role modeling permeates all these aspects, right? And we can get further down into brass tacks about different aspects of medicine, but it is a powerful tool that has been called out in all these areas as something we would do. In fact, um, in 2006, Stern and Papadakis actually wrote an article that talked about professionalism formation, and they said you should have some sort of programming for professionalism in your medical school, and it had three things involved. You have to have expectations set, and they talked about codes and charters. The second piece was that you had to provide experience, and pointedly they say that was through role models, right? So a third of the process of developing professionalism was through role modeling. Um, and then you need to evaluate the outcomes. But I, I found it powerful that basically decide what you want, re read the outcomes, and everything in between is role modeling for professionalism, which should be good, right? That should be a very positive thing for everybody. And then the learners look at that. When you interview learners, you find that 90% of medical graduates can remember a, a somebody model who shaped their professional attitude, who made a difference, who changed them. Um, it is a preferred method of learning. When you talk to learners, they like to learn from role modeling. Um, it impacts career choice, and it impacts residency satisfaction. There have been studies that talked about residency satisfaction is up if the residents can identify better role models, or enough role models, right? Positive role models, let me be clear about that. So it's good, right? It impacts a lot of what we do in medical education, important parts of medical education, and the learners want it. We did a study back in uh, 2010, this was actually uh, the thesis, that looked at, so just a little backstory. there was a period before 2010 where a lot of data was coming out that said hospitalists are better educators than everybody else, which I loved, um, but I also found to be an odd statement that hospitalists, what, we're just so much better at teaching. Uh, so we did a study to figure out what were the qualities and skills of exemplary pediatric hospitalists, and what we found was interesting. They talked about teaching skills, personal qualities, and patient care skills, which comes up in the literature. Every other paper you'll ever read about, about educators says those three things. 
But then when you, read, when you read our literature, there was a third part of role modeling. And it came out a very unique piece for us. A lot of prior studies will just say well, you are a, a role model and that's just one of the areas. It might be under one of these three other things. We pulled it out as a very distinct thing. We'll talk about why in a little bit. But it was not that you were just a role model. It was that you were very explicit about how you were a role model. And it could be in any of these three areas. But it was the most notable part of our study. Just so you know, by the way, the bottom line on what makes us much better educators than everybody else, allegedly, is we're around. That was the only difference. So don't think any, we're not that much more special. Um, so role modeling became a really big piece of this. And then when uh, young Rena back there did a study on what, uh, how students learn from residents in the workplace, because we were looking at residents as <laughs> teachers, the number one method used by residents to teach was role modeling. And they broke it down a little bit, like general role modeling. I think that's where we'll get into the definition, like what does that mean? What is a role model? But admitting their limitations, they role model that. <laughs> um, applying knowledge to clinical care. So the first one's kind of a personal quality. The second one is a little bit of a patient care and then advocating. So that is the number one way learners learn from residents. And it is a recurring theme in educators. So we definitely know that it is being used, whether being seen by the learners themselves or the teachers themselves, that they use role modeling all the time. Fantastic, why am I standing up here then? What do we possibly need to talk about? Well, there's a significant problem. And if you, actually, you also look at other data about it, we're not doing it very well. So multiple studies have shown there's a deficit. Uh, one study said that only 40% of their attendings were viewed as role models. Flip that language, 60% of the attendings of the people in the study they felt were not role models. And good role models is how we're looking at it. That's disconcerting, right? Um, in another one, that half of students felt they had no role model. They didn't have a role model at all. There was no real good role model there. Residents have said the same thing. So it's interesting. This is how they want to learn. We talk about this is the way to teach professionalism, to counteract the hidden curriculum, to help professional identity formation. And they're lost. They can't find them. I feel like some of this data, uh, I like to pretend this data must be old because it's 2014. And gosh golly, a lot has happened in the past five years. Um, but some of these studies were older, so it is one of those situations that should concern us, right? What are, if this is such a powerful tool, what is happening and why aren't we doing it? And I love this quote from an article as far back as 2003 because I think it partly explains it. Educators lack an adequate understanding of the process through which learners respond to models and of how practitioners of varying quality and commitment exert their influence. Bottom line, we don't understand the power of it, and we don't know how to do it. And I love the piece of this that's interesting, because it's in the second half, and it's a little bit hidden. Practitioners of varying quality and commitment. Interesting. So it says, like, we don't understand how, it, as we may not be, as like, we can all sit here and say, that doctor's better than me, or I'm better than that doctor. You're probably wrong. You're just egotistical at that point. But like, we all have varying abilities in certain areas. And so that has a huge impact, but also it's a piece you can work with and how we don't understand how we can use that. And not surprisingly, when they've looked at residents to talk about role modeling, and they've done a study of role modeling in residents, uh, role mo uh, residents thought role modeling was just showing good clinical behaviors. We're going to debunk that myth in a little bit. I told you I was going to give you bad examples of me and why I still need to go to sessions on teaching all the time. Um, and I love this, learn from role modeling just happens as long as the learner is watching just happens, just this random thing that occurs. And we'll talk about that, because that's where our flaw is, I think, for a lot of this. Um, they think role, model, like role modeling doesn't equal being a role model. Like, it's confounding. And then uh, you learn about role modeling from watching role models, yet half of them don't have role models. So again, we're in a little bit of a sticky wicket here, right? So we don't understand how to use role modeling. We don't understand what it means. Residents don't know it either. So that is where I think we have a lot of room to grow, and I'm going to focus mainly on that. So let's talk about a definition. I told you it was coming. Who, has a, who wants to take an attempt at a definition of role modeling? Here's the good news. You can't be wrong. <laughs> What's the definition of role modeling? Yes? How about being somebody that somebody else wants to be? Yeah. There you go. So it's that. Um, it's exemplar in a sense that somebody sees in you wonderful qualities that they then want to imitate, they want to do. Excellent. That's, what, that's, a, that's a nice approach to a definition. Anybody else have another one? It's a tricky thing where you may aspire to be a role model, but it's all in the eye of the beholder. 
Ah. The, the, your effect is only how much the person takes it in or notices or pays attention or whatever. So you can aspire yeah. to model, but it really depends on the person that you're trying to model. So there's a learner component to role modeling, and there's a there's a almost bi-directionality, conversationality to role modeling, where it can't just be like, I'm, I'm over here being the best me I can be, but maybe I'm not really role modeling because the receiver isn't really taking it in. Great. Yes? I, mean, I think it's, it's purposeful. So like, mm. Right? So you, you can role model, but you can't decide if you are a role model. That's, that's somebody else's decision. Interesting. So as a role model, I can pers purposefully choose to do things that I feel like I'm, in, I'm showing an example to instill in you, but that doesn't make me necessarily the role model, right? They ha they're the ones who have to decide that. Yeah, so this is a good start. I'm going to show you a couple of definitions. There's a lot, and we'll hopefully get to one that might be sort of close to what we're talking about. So here are two. One is a person considered to demonstrate a standard of excellence to be imitated. That sounds great. Or persons from whom one wants to gain attributes. Now, the limitation on this, Pete, I think you got at, which is that's great, but what if they pick up the wrong thing? Right? What if you do something on a bad day? Because I know you guys never do anything imperfect. And they pick up that, right? Or worse yet, or better yet, I'm not sure which. But what if you do something great and they don't notice it, right? I love to give an example of um, when I was in a psychiatry rotation as a medical student. And I just imitated. That was my goal. I think I was scared of psychiatry. I mean. They told you all about patients attacking you, and so we were very worried in charity in New Orleans. And uh, I imitated everything my resident did to a fault. And I, I just had a patient, and she was manic. Uh, she was bipolar off her meds. She outweighed me by 100 pounds. And my resident just kept sitting. And I thought my resident was, I said, then this must be how you approach this patient. Just keep sitting. Don't stand up. It will trigger her. Even as the patient came up to me, stared at me menacingly, I stayed seated. My resident was still sitting, and she knew everything. Um, I stopped staying seating when the patient hit me with both her shoes in the head, and she ran down the hallway. But like everything in my body was like, I should probably stand up at this point. But I was mimicking. I was imitating, right? It's a funnier version of what went wrong. But you can imagine, this is just this basically says a role model is someone you want to be like, but it doesn't necessarily take into account the process. So then you have the role modeling. The first one, unconscious adoption or imitation. That's that piece, right? I'm sitting there. Somebody moves their hand a certain way, I move my hand a certain way. They sit there, I sit there. I don't think about any of it, I just do what they do. And the problem with that is that you can miss a lot, right? So then uh, another version, we've upped the game. Purposeful is kind of getting into it a little bit. Unconscious or conscious, it's either or now. A teaching by practicing physicians who are by, are by default role models uh, because they are observed by students. So this takes a little of the passivity into it, right? Like, by default, because I'm here and you see me, I'm a role model. And it does say I'm being, I'm still unconscious possibly in what I'm doing, but I could be more conscious about it. But there's still no broader um, thought process to it. So then you get to a more robust, which is deliberate teaching interventions such as demonstration of skills or behaviors which are intended to ach achieve specific learning objectives. I like this one better. I don't love achieve specific learning objectives, although I, I'm an educator and I love objectives. I think the idea of asking a clinician to sit down in their head before they have an encounter with the learner and go, I'm going to list the three objectives using smart objectives, I think it's a little weird. But the idea of knowing that when I'm in this scenario, boy, my learner could get some, this piece from me, and I'm aware of it, and I'm going to make a point of it, and I'm going to be deliberate about it, that's really powerful, right? Um, it's also very powerful because if this has the opportunity that if you're not deliberate and make, do something and it's not perfect, you could still draw on it, right? Because you know what, you can take it and think about, well, what's the anti-objective, so to speak? So I want to argue that we need to be more purposeful, I like your word, more deliberate, more thoughtful about how we are as role models. Not just saying, I know I'm a role model because someone sees me, but I'm a role model and how can I use that to achieve something? And I don't, again, you don't have to write down your objective, but what can I do? And there are ways you can do this. So quick aside on role modeling, this always comes up in ta this talk, is role modeling versus mentoring, and what is the difference? Yeah, so 
So you as a mentor are probably going to be a role model in some ways, right? People come to you because they see something. They come to you for as a research mentor because you're really good at research, or they come to you as a um, clinical mentor. And so you will probably role model, but role models do not in any way have to mentor, right? A role model, again, could be just, I'm on survey. I don't have to become your best friend. I don't have to know about your kids. I don't have to know any of those kinds of things as a role model. It's more of the, a very focused concentration. But mentoring is very different. So sometimes we get a little on a sticky wicket on that, so I want to make sure we clarified. So here's what I'm arguing, and this is what came up in our study. That role modeling that is metacognitive, is how we think about it, is the best type of role modeling. Role modeling that is explicit. Role modeling that uses the encounter of the role modeling to have a conversation and dig deeper into it. It's the way as an attending I can say, as an example, so we're going to go, um, this mom is very angry. Uh, we're going to go talk to her. I'm going to use this framework I've learned on how to de-escalate. I wish I could tell you a framework right now, but there's a framework out there. Um, and it has these four steps, and that's what I'm going to try and do. I have just, instead of just going in a room and doing great de-escalation techniques, I'm telling you what those de-escalation techniques are. I've given you access to my process and access to my thinking. It does a couple things. It, it has a teaching objective in there, without calling it that, and it activates the learner. It says to the learner, hey, watch it. See if I do it, right? Or see what goes right or wrong, right? Rather than just going into the room, and when it goes wrong, the learner going, well, that wasn't good. I'm not going to pick up any on that. When We all know sometimes when it goes wrong, you've done everything right. And then maybe there's another point to learn. So we'll talk about this. So let's put it all together and think of a framework. And through uh, a lot of the articles and studies that have been done on role modeling, I've thought about there's three real good ways we can look at how we can do this. The first is be a model, right? Be a good role model. Like, that's a starting point, right? Number two is be a facilitator for that role model. That's what we alluded to. And then the learner has a role. And the more and more I do talks on feedback, talks on role modeling, talks on teaching, the learner has a role in it, and we never talk about it, right? It's a very unidirectional thing. This should be, this should be both sides working on this effort. So educator as a model, we talked about, right? It comes up in every study. You can role model personal qualities, teaching skills, and clinical skills. So what are those? What have we found that people are, who are great role models do? And they've done some really good studies on that. So what would you think would be a personal quality of someone who's a good role model? Like what, is a personal, what, what does a person need to have personally, internally, as a human being to be a good role model? Empathy. Empathy. That's a fantastic one, right? Especially in our field, I'd like to know you have empathy. What else? I think you have to look like you're enjoying what you're doing, like you're having fun. There. So I'm at, if you show it, yeah. but if it doesn't look like you're enjoying it, you're having fun, why do they come along to do it? Right. So I'll pull two things from that. Positive outlook is one, and we all can get dragged down into the negative side of things. And then enthusiasm. And, and to be honest, anytime uh, anything is talked about teaching, if you just yell enthusiasm as an answer, you're probably right. Um, so there's positive outlook and there's enthusiasm. What else do you need? Empathy, enthusiasm, positive outlook? Money to buy them dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can we get that? I mean, well, they do like food, right? But does that make you a better role model? I give them food. <laughs> I would say that enables the world modeling. I certainly, I, I'm a pediatrician. I have two different bowls of candy in my office. I have the chocolate candy drawer and the non-chocolate because you have to keep them divided. I mean, not everyone likes it. David? I'm going to go with the, um, the, the dinner, but uh, I think more probably generosity of spirit. You're willing to give things even when you feel like you're not necessarily getting them. Yeah. I think that's great. I think when you have that generosity of spirit, when you are willing to give, right, that is a huge thing of role modeling. Anything else? Yeah. Self-awareness of your own practice. Self-awareness is huge. Self-awareness is if you aren't aware of your own practice, that personal quality, it will, if you, the absence of it will seriously limit your ability to grow and your ability to then take the next steps based on feedback. Pete. Um, so, you know, wow, the person is really good at talking to patients or why wow, they're really good at yeah. So I'll say from a personal quality standpoint, it's the communication skill piece. Um, and so there have been a bunch of studies on this. There's two uh, that are notable. Um, my favorite is the one on the right because the author is 
H-G-A-R, Jochumsen van der Lue, and I really want to meet that person. I, I can't even imagine what the H-G-A-R stands for, if that's the last name. Um, but and personal skills, you've got to be able to talk to people. Makes sense. Uh, positive outlook, we've got commitment to growth. That, and that's self-awareness. I'm aware and I'm willing to grow. Um, integrity comes up in both their studies. Easy to work with. Uh, Self-confident. That's a big piece, right? To be a good role model, you have to be confident in what you, and not narcissistic and not arrogant, just confident in what you do, right? Because if you're looking, oh, I don't know, no one's going to want to follow that if you're not sure about yourself. <coughs> so then we had teaching skills. Teaching skills we get at a little bit. Um, rapport with learners. I will tell you, studies have shown you don't need to know who their third cousin's dog is. You don't have to, like, know their, everything about their girlfriend or boyfriend. You just have to have a good rapport. So it doesn't mean you have to be their best friend. You just have to have some connection with them. Um, people who develop specific teaching methods take time to learn those. So congratulations, you're all doing it right now. Well done. Um, commitment to growth of the learner. So we notice as an individual, we need to be committed to our own growth, but we also have to be committed to their growth. Uh, rapport, learner-centered, safe learning environment. If you look at the right side, it's really all the fundamentals of adult learning theory are there. But as a teacher, you need to have these, and then you can be a really good role model from that. And then patient care skills. Number one is my favorite competent. The bar is not high, right? It's, it, no one is sitting there and said, which is funny because I just said it's role model and we talk about exemplars. Not really. Just to have a competency level, which is great for anyone who's junior because I think a lot of junior teachers think they can't be role models because they aren't the expert in the field. But the reality is you just have to be competent. Um, committed to growth again, up to date, compassionate, communication skills, respect for patients. All those make you a good role model. And the thing about all of this is we can all work on these. I can look at this list right now and tell you where I'm not good at it, right? But if the first step in the framework of having ideal role modeling is you yourself modeling good behaviors, it's these, right? So I think of all the times, and I'm sure none of you have done it, but I do it all. I'm a hospitalist. Um, it's busy. Maybe occasionally someone from the ED admits a patient, and I have thoughts. They might be negative thoughts about why that patient was admitted and what they did, darn it, in that ED. Sometimes those come out of my mouth in front of my learners, right? That's not good role modeling, right? That's, I would call that probably patient care and teaching skills and personal qualities all in one. I'm modeling negative negativity. I'm modeling lack of respect. And it's not because I don't like my ED colleagues. I worked in the ED for 14 years. It's just that at that moment. So thinking about the moments where we can like polish ourselves up a little bit, where are you stronger? Because there's some areas in this I'm, I don't even have to think about. I'm rock solid on. And there are other areas I can learn from looking at my peers. So as individuals, we need to be focused on how can we improve ourselves just in the skills that we can role model. And I think the list makes it really handy to think about where we might have strengths and weaknesses. I would imagine as you sit here, you can probably, from those lists I just showed you, think about one strength and what one weakness right now, right? And if you think about that one weakness, put it on a list. See how you can work on it today, tomorrow, or the next day, right? Because that's our growth and that's our activity. So then that's the idea of we have to be good role models ourselves. We can develop ourselves. We can become better. The next part of the framework is our facilitation. And this gets back to what I was alluding to earlier, the metacognitive piece. And there is a fantastic paper from several years ago that has this chart. And I love this chart. This chart tells the three ways this can go down. And the way on the left is the least favorite, but the most common. You basically, someone observes me, they don't think about it at all, and then they do what I did. Imitation. OK, I mean, if I, if I knocked it out of the park that day, awesome. If I knocked it out of the park and they saw what I did, awesome. If I knocked it out of the park and they didn't see what I did, nothing happened, right? So it's not ideal. If you go to the right side, OK, now it gets interesting. This is the really good learner you've had. This is that really, I like to call them reflectors. I like to think of them the people who journal a lot, who spend a lot of time thinking. They're the opposite of me. I very much like I'm the person who sees a squirrel and chases it. I don't have time to think. But these are the other people. And they have an observation. And then they actively explore it within themselves. They ask themselves, do I like that? I didn't like how that went down. I don't think I'm going to do that. Or I thought that was amazing. I really feel the patient responded. I'm going to try that. And then they change their behavior. It's a step up. But they're a learner. So they probably, they still might have gotten it wrong. Or you might have done three things and they only picked up on one. And so that's better. It's not pure imitation. It's imitation with a filter. 
But the ideal is in the middle. And the idea in the middle is that you observe, you make the unconscious conscious. It came from that earlier definition. Either I say what I was doing or what I'm going to do, or you say, I think I saw this. We overtly identify it. It's explicit. Then we reflect on it and abstract, right? So, so the abstraction, this is really from cold, the idea that we're going to have reflection and abstract conceptualization. And, and then we're going to talk about it. I went into that room. You saw me have that conversation. went downhill very quickly, right? Let me talk about what I was doing when I started, which was the idea, and where it went wrong. Here's how I might change it. Oh my gosh, think of what I learned from that, but my learner learns from that. And then you translate those insights into principles. So now I know I've talked to my attending. Let's think about what you would do differently the next time, and then you do it. That's the right way to do it, right? That's me as an attending facilitating them from either of these two sides. If they're not the reflector, I've helped them go where they've never gone. If they are the reflector, it's an easier journey, and I can help them get more robustly out of it. Going back to our characteristics, you have to be self-confident to do this. Because you're going to be pointing out areas where you have failed as well as where you've succeeded. And it's hard. You have to be confident enough to say, whew, not a good day. I, years ago, gave this talk a bunch of times, or we did, a work, we did it as a workshop. And one day, I had a patient come in who was going to have a diagnosis of cancer. I'm a hospitalist. I, I hate the diagnosis of cancer. That's why I'm not a hematologist oncologist. And so we, a few times a year, will get one that we're going to have to make the diagnosis. Most often they're made in the outpatient or ED just because of labs. And the outpatient orthopedist had missed it for about three or four months. They had all the information they needed, but they missed it. It was an outside orthopedist, not ours. Came in, presentation on rounds, first day. My student, and one of my pet peeves in the world is saying, and they know this, is saying the plan is we'll talk to the specialist. Um, and the learner said, bless her heart, um, and so ortho wants this. Like, it was just telling me what ortho wanted. And my response was, because I was emotionally challenged by this case, I don't give a F what the orthopedics pedis wants. And then I said, we're going to do this. So I went home that day, because I've been thinking about this, and I was like, that was horrible. Let's agree on so many levels that was horrible. Um, I know why it happened, um, and I sweated all night. I got my gumption up. I went back the next day on the first part of rounds. This is before we start, I need to talk about what happened yesterday. And I said, here's what happened. Here's what was going on. Here's why I did it. Here's what I should have done. Here's where I should have sought help, right? Because I was clearly having, it had nothing to do with the medicine. It had to do with me being upset about this. Um, and here's where I should have done it. Now, I was really proud of myself. At the end, one of the res seniors goes, Oh, Dr. Fermi, you swear all the time. We didn't even notice. And I'm like, good Lord, it wasn't about the swearing. It was partially about the swearing. Um, but it was that moment that to say, I had a really bad experience. But at the same time, you can go and say, you know what? I, no I knocked that out of the park, right? If you did have a very good experience where you're talking to a family and it goes very well while people are observing you, right? Or you get the procedure or whatever happens. But they, they need to hear what it is and they need to hear how they can apply it. So that's the argument for us as facilitators. Now, the problems with the left side, and there are some benefits. So when you talk about imitation, there's data on that that says it is really simple. When you are immersing into third year for the first time and you are overwhelmed, imitation is a simple way to do stuff, and it's a coping mechanism. So, there, so it's not that imitation is horrible. Um, but the disadvantage is they actually talk about it can stifle self-reflection, right? And our process, recommended process, pushes self-reflection. Um, and it prevents response to evolving patient needs and ethical norms. So if you only know how to imitate, you can't adapt. So there are other, there's some positives, and you might see it earlier in the clinical years, and as a valuable tool, but know that it long term won't help. And then opportunities for facilitation are easy. We can role model role modeling, right? That's the meta meta part of it. That if you say, like, I'm actually trying to do this because I know I want you to learn the right thing from me. Then the resident, who is a role model, knows how they can do it, and they can make it more active. And it shows your growth. It shows your insight. It shows your reflection. It role models a lot of things to have that conversation. Um, you can deconstruct the anti-modeling. That's the piece I gave the example of. Like when it goes bad, and it will go bad, don't hide from it. You can actually help people guide through it. Um, it also helps you get feedback. Imagine saying, I'm going to go do this in this room. I want you to watch and give me feedback later. That learner stops making their grocery list while you're doing it, because we've all been that person thinking of something else, because they're paying attention to tell you what they thought. And now suddenly you can get some feedback. 
And then it activates the learners. There's so many times when we're doing something and the learner is just like in la-la land uh, because they're busy or thinking about something else. And this is a really strong way to get them involved. And then the final piece is learner as reflector. And this is something we can facilitate as well, but we should incorporate into our curricula. Um, and Donald Schoen, obviously reflection in action, reflection on action. Reflection is one of those things. How many people here think they're a natural reflector? Yeah, it's OK if you do. They're, yeah. Do you journal? Are you the journalers? I always call them the journalers, yeah. If I see, I have like a stack of like journals I've been given in my lifetime, and there's nothing in them. I just stack them up. Um, but so some of it's easier, and some of it's harder for us. So the reflection action is what I'm doing right now. I'm in the process. I'm thinking, how is this going? Look at the faces. What do I need to change? And then reflection on action is what I'm going to do on the cab back to the hotel, saying, all right, what would I have tweaked? I, Rena knows this. I gutted this presentation um, before I gave it. So like, this is really me going to reflect on how did my changes work, right? I wanted to do something that's different. I'll reflect on that. We need to help learners do that. We need to help them, if I'm having a bad day, be on that right side of that circle to do it on their own, right? Um, this is Bandura again, and you can see his model. You observe the role model, and then you have the period of apperception, which again is the attention, retention, reproduction, motivation piece. That's the piece we have to teach them to do well, right? To understand why they would do it, how they would do it. Um, and then obviously the environment, the person, and the behavior affect it, and then that's where they go. So if we're not there to help them guide their action, we want them to be better at that apperception piece. And we can actually help them with that skill through everything we do to teach them, teach them how to reflect better, right? Self-awareness was one of our uh, role modeling skills. Self-awareness is a big piece of this for them as well, self-awareness of their needs. So you want to push them a little bit for that. So how do we apply it? Hopefully you've already thought of maybe some ideas that we've got. Um, but I like to think about it like easily through frameworks we already have. So the core competencies in the EPAs, right? I think these are really great ways of thinking about it. So let's think about the EPAs, which are the core and trustable professional activities for our medical students. And I just pulled out a couple that I think role modeling would work really well in. Document a clinical encounter in the patient record. We don't talk about that, right? Uh, they write their note. Are you guys using student notes now? Have you guys gone forward with that? Yeah, I know some sites aren't. But like, OK, I get their note. The resident gets their note, whatever. The resident makes, doesn't make any edits. I don't make any edits. I send it back, right? Or maybe I do make edits. But that learner is not. Uh, is not the reflector, and they never look at it again. The learner is the reflector. They hit the revision button so they can see what I did, but they don't know why I did what I did. So me showing why I edited their note, or here's how I write a note and why I write it this way, right? Residents could do that really well. Uh, form clinical questions, show a role model how to find evidence. That's an easy way to do this, right? We have a question. Let me show you how to do it. Here's a framework for seeking an answer to a question, whether it's you know, the PICO or PICO. I never say PICO or PICO, right? I don't know which one it is. Question or whatever your method is. Um, transitions, give handovers. Even me just saying I give a handover to, like I gave a handover on Sunday night, and my learners know I'm giving patient handovers, but to show them once would be really interesting. Uh, collaborate with interprofessional teams, how I role model with nurses. And nurse, some nurses can drive me insane, for sure. But role modeling when I do it well, or, or calling out when I do it well, or not. Um, informed consent, I don't do that a lot, but I think a lot of people do do, and so just showing them how to do that. All good EPAs. All of them you can do, but these are some that just stood out to me that, wow, this is a practical place I could have an explicit conversation about how I'm doing it and why I'm doing it. And it doesn't take a lot of extra time, right? For us, in residency, we have the competencies and milestones within that. I went with the competencies because everybody has their own milestones. But you can imagine patient care, medical knowledge, practice-based learning, all of these have areas you can sit. Interpersonal and communication skills are a big one. Professionalism, we already talked about this is where they learn it. So having an explicit conversation would be huge. And then systems-based practice, which is still nebulous for all of us. Um, but one of them is, uh, one of ours in PEDS is accepting that ambiguity, accepting the role of ambiguity in medicine, something to that effect. That's an interesting thing to role model. It's basically accepting that sometimes, uh, right? That's a huge thing to role model to say, I don't know, it's a challenge right now. Here's what I do with that. Or let me tell you, I don't know. Oh, Lord, a role model, I don't know? That's powerful for learners, especially the more salt and pepper you get in your hair, the more people think you know everything, right? Clearly, no one thinks I know everything. There's no salt and pepper yet. I don't know. I think that's a good thing to not have. Some. You don't, Rainier. You don't. Good on you. Yes, I think you're, you're what, 35? Yeah, you're just dying white. You're smart. Get that, get that senior look early. 
So here's my question for you. If you thought of the role you're in or how you work with learners, what do you think you could role model? What would be a good uh, venue for role modeling for you? What could you do, like, just tomorrow? Where could you role model explicitly and actively? I think what we're learning here, what I certainly learned, is at the outset, I didn't fully distinguish role modeling from having good person quality, teaching skills, and patient care skills. But the key, I think, what, what you said to me is about turning the unconscious into the conscious by not just do something right. that's a good example. I mean, I can go into a hospital room with my fellows, and I can do all the right things, call the patient by her first name, introduce myself in my role, sit down when I talk to her, wash my hands in front of her before I examine her. But that's not role modeling until I think, call explicit attention yep. of the learner to what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Or even better, asking the learners what they observe. Yeah. And making sure that they notice that those were the so there's a there's an interesting thing that you could do like I wouldn't do it on every patient every day rounds would become interminable right but if you decided just on one patient you're gonna go in at the end without prompting in the end come out of the room and say can you guys identify three things I did in that room and you intentionally made it obvious that like and it's funny it makes me a better doctor when I do it I'm like oh I'm gonna role model today oh yeah I'll wash my hands a little bit more clear or whatever I'll make sure to get a good water Purell in there like can you tell me three things I did that were you know, ideal for patient and then see what they come up with? And you did more than three, and so then you have that very quick, quick. You tell me three, exactly. I washed my hands, I called her by her first name, I introduced myself this way. Or for me, in peds, and I always say I kneel at the bedside, not because I'm praying, but because I get to eye level with the, with the patients. I talk to the patient, if they're at older than a certain age, I talk to the patient first. Before I talk, and I have them introduce me to their parents. That's how I approach it. So if I did it, I'd see, did they pick up on that I was kneeling, or did they think I was just tired, or I was just being funny, right? Um, so that's great. Like, you could do that one room a day. Um, it would become known as your thing, and they'd be on guard in every room. They'd be like, oh, he asked at least once a day. We better pay. I had an attendee who once asked me uh, at the end of the first day of rounds I was going to be on with her two weeks, what did, tell me three things you learned today. I had a panic attack. And outright, pay. I'm like, I don't know what I learned today. But after that, you better believe I was paying attention to everything. So when they know it's coming, like, don't tell them the first time. But then it suddenly becomes a thing. That's a great example. What else could you guys do? Anybody have another idea of how they would explicitly role model tomorrow? David. Uh, I, this is perfect about me, but in, in residency, when I was here located at the VA, we had an attending for the month who was an oncologist. Um, and every single patient we went on rounds with him, he made sure that he did one thing for the sake of the patient's comfort. Oh, he, nice. Yeah, pillow, he brought him ice, whatever, it didn't make a difference yeah. he was, but he always made sure that before we left the room, in addition to everything else, he made sure, and, and he never did the other piece, which was talk about He never told you about it. So starkly different than everything that we had seen, that now, almost 30 years later, 25, whatever. You remember it. I distinctly remember that was that was his thing. He wanted to make sure he was this brilliant, accomplished. Public. All these other things, yep. But he always made went out of his way to make sure that the patient had one small thing that would make them a little more just physically comfortable in the moment, not orders for more. No, right. It has nothing to do with the rest. So what I'm wondering is, so you got it and you remember it 30 years later. I wonder if some of your other students didn't. So even if he said, like, at the beginning of rounds or, like, at the end of rounds or at the, at the beginning of the week, just, you know, one of the things I always like to do is find one way to attend to comfort that's not medical. Um, and you'll see me do it, but I just wanted you to know it's something I do in case you want to try it. That means that not only do you get it and remember it because you were that more reflective learner that was like, I'm paying attention, but to, it captures those other ones who are probably, let's be honest, the ones who need it more, right, the ones who need to notice it better. Yes? One thing you haven't mentioned is the degree of complexity of the task we want them to pick up. Yes. You can role model putting a suture in, mm -hmm. but no one ever sees me do psychotherapy. Yes. Patients don't tolerate a student right. watching you do psychotherapy. So now we have something everybody can watch, mm -hmm. something that is just not able to right. have the student watch. Yeah. What do you do in that situation, 
no person ever sees me do psychotherapy. This is a shame. <laughs> Understandable, now, but... In the consult service, mm -hmm. at the bedside, yep. in medicine, Different. they can watch yeah. me work. Yeah. But in the privacy of once a week psychotherapy yeah. for borderline and so forth, no one sees me work. I think, so I how think, you put that right. Concept of role model. I think it's partly storytelling. Um, if they can't be in the room with me, you guys weren't in the room with me, and I told you a couple stories, right? You may or may not remember them as well as the people who were in the room with me, but storytelling, I think, could do it. Like giving, like just sitting down periodically, uh, whenever you're on with them, to say, I want to tell you about some of my therapy sessions and some of the things I try to do. Obviously, simulation, um, things like that would be the other avenue to do it, role play, those things. But I think a simple, cheap version is just storytelling, to express to them where you were in, in in this psychotherapy session and what didn't didn't go right, and how this was the framework you were using. But what uh, I was just telling somebody, I always give the feedback to, we do family involved rounds. We don't do the full family center rounds, but families come out. And I always, was, I always hammer for the poor students, like, layman's terms, layman's terms, you know, don't say NPO. And so this one kid had really worked on it. This was a couple weeks ago. And I thought he was really, did a great job. And then the mom looked up when we said room air and said, what's that? And I said, holy crud. Room is a normal word. Air is a normal word. So I never looked at it as like a medically complex term. But then you're right. America doesn't call sitting here room air. And so I've told that story three or four times. And like learners get that. Yeah, so storytelling can be as simple as storytelling, or sim, or role play. But the important thing is seeing someone do it. Sure. But I see how you relate, as uh, Dr. Sacker was saying, you, you see this person wash their hands. Right. You see this person say first name. You see that I let them listen. Yeah. It seems to me a Role well, I mean, going back to the endurance, it's observation. observation. Yeah. Now, if you have a situation where you can't observe it, then I think you have to create. Change the concept of role modeling. No, I think you can still role model through conversation and storytelling. It's a different experience, but because we have the restrictions we have about observation, then you're looking at other ways to paint it. But it's a great, it's an excellent point. Um, no, no, I, I, A lot of the teaching that I did, for example, is uh, first and second year medical students in our arts, science, and medicine course. Right. And, and I just want to make that point because the thing that you think about storytelling, which I think a lot of us take for granted, first and second year students or even junior residents are so hungry to hear about experiences of people who are, are much more experienced. Than yep. Them. I think a lot of us sort of dismiss the fact that they have all these stories that to us may not seem as relevant or as they don't seem like structured clinical yeah. Creating a straight. Yeah, so there are lots of situations in, in home care and home visits where. Oh, for sure. Or, um, I've had an encounter with a patient or the family, and there was no one there, but I really feel compelled to convey that yeah. to people because I learned so much in that moment from it. And, and I think it's, it's not the same as being there, but it's. It's not, but you can give the experience. I, I run a preceptor group, and. For, I, I, I'm a, like we had a rule when I was growing up that my stories could only be 45 seconds long. Like it had to be a family rule, so you know I like to tell a story. And um, I always tell stories about patients, and I always thought it just annoyed people. But I've actually gotten a feedback in my evaluations saying we love when she brings in a patient story. And I was like, oh, and then it was basically a license to tell as many stories as I wanted, and my parents would die if they knew it. But yeah, storytelling is powerful. So. Just to wrap up, a couple tips and tricks. Um, so again, be explicit in what you're doing and what you're thinking. Open up the brain and let them in. It's the only way they can really have that robust experience. And you don't have to do it with everything you do at every second. But for the big things that you can sit there and go, oh, this is something that really is powerful. Share your doubts and uncertainties. Role model being imperfect. Role modeling being unsure. Um, and then model beyond the clinical. We didn't talk about some things. Uh, Work-life integration is a powerful way to role model. Like, you know, I'm going to cut out a little early um, today if you don't need me because my daughter has a volleyball game and I want to get there, right? That's huge, right, to show that this is important to me. Um, your own professional development, saying you went to X, Y, or Z, like I went to a wonderful um, workshop on uh, safe space training, 
And I brought it back and said, uh, I was like, oh, is that a safe spending trading? They're like, Ugh. And I said, no, 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 it was great. Like showing that I go to things and I try to learn. And then your own personal development, like whether that is how you're, what you're doing outside for yourself and showing that that's important too. So we don't always have to make it clinical. There are other ways we can role model. And I think we can't, we shouldn't miss out on those. And so just quick recap, role modeling is essential. Um, you can develop yourself as a model and that's important. But you need to be an explicit guide to them. And that's probably the biggest piece I want to hammer home. But then how can we work with reflectivity for learners, help them become better reflectors? Because that's going to be the partnership that we need to do this well. Because if they're not good reflectors, even if I'm really active, they're not going to be a great receiver and participant in it. So um, hopefully you can think of one thing. If you didn't speak up, you might have one thing you want to try differently for tomorrow or the next day. Um, and I'd like to thank Rena for inviting me and then Matteo for being Matteo. Um, I always have, and then all my role models. Um, I've had many fantastic and not so fantastic role models. I've learned from all of them. Um, and uh, I'm very honored to have had them. So thank you guys for having me and I'm happy to answer any questions.